Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the GBBC Virtual Members Forum. This is a bi-weekly webinar we host showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we have the pleasure to be joined by Ali Hackett, Chief Revenue Officer at LiquidX, and Kristen Mishad, Managing Director at LiquidX for a presentation on how LiquidX is transforming the traditional working capital in trade finance space through the use of leading technology solutions, including blockchain. Just briefly, before we begin, I'd like to introduce Ali and Kristen. So Ali is the Chief Revenue at Officer at LiquidX, where she is responsible for global strategy and execution of all revenue generated activities, including sales, marketing, and client services. She has 30 years of experience in the financial services industry, including a 20 year career at Citigroup, where she rose to be the co head of Global Prime Finance. And more recently, she spent time at FinTech, Thesis Technologies, where she was Chief Revenue Officer, and at the London Stock Exchange as the US country head, and at CME Group as Global Head of Client Development and Sales. Uh, Kristen, as I mentioned, is Managing Director at LiquidX, and she is responsible for leading the in-block product, focusing on digitization of the working capital process. She has over 20 years of experience in treasury and financial systems, and most recently worked at General Electric, where she was responsible for global cash operations, including cash infrastructure, controls, and digital transformation. She has delivered large-scale transformation efforts for GE, including establishing the treasury digital strategy, payment transformation, and establishing, establishing treasury capabilities in the shared services centers. Prior to GE, she worked at IBM, where she had leadership roles in global financial systems, treasury, and business consulting. We're so pleased to have them here with us today, and we welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar. You can place them in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll take them following their presentation. Thank you, Kristen and Ali, for joining us, and I'll hand things over to you to begin. Thank you so much, Sophia and uh, the GBBC for hosting us. Um, it is a privilege. We at Liquidex solve for uh, all the issues along the, the trade finance, otherwise known as the working capital uh, uh, stream. And part of that is the origination and part of it is financing. And then of course, the distribution of these trade finance assets. Just for context, I'm gonna give an overview of the company and Christian will spend the majority of time really focusing on the blockchain solution. We do incorporate all of the newest technologies, but for this purpose of this uh, video, we are really going to be addressing uh, the blockchain. We are backed by Broadridge, and that's important because you can imagine for anybody that doesn't know them, they process trillions of tr transactions a day uh, for many of the big banks. And so they have to be on their game for InfoSec security for the data of, of customers. And we follow those protocols being a Broadridge backed company. The other part of that I think is interesting in just this whole trade finance space is our founder is Jim Toffee. And for context of how we were built and how he thought through those solutions is years ago, and, and this is decades ago, the uh, only electronified markets was really the equity markets. And then Jim had the idea that, well, why wouldn't fixed income be? And there was a lot of resistance. It took decades before TradeWeb, where he was the CEO and founder, got real traction. And at the time, treasuries were actually traded by phone, by fax, the old broker way. And now at least 95% is done electronified. So it's almost like people today, if you weren't around at the beginning, were thinking, well, of course you trade it electronically. But there was decades before that took hold. That's how I think he thinks of the, of the space for working capital. It is really at the early phases, the same for blockchain technology, right? It's at the early phases. It may take time. I doubt it will take decades, but you know, there's piecemeal ways of, of solving for it. And I think when Kristen speaks about our approach for the working capital space and the way we built out the solution from start to finish for all the different constituents that participate in this space, whether they're corporations, whether they're banks, whether they're non-banks, the insurance companies that lend itself to insuring some of these different asset classes. I think you'll see that we've addressed the entire ecosystem that plays in this space, but also we built the technology to be modular. So people can come in and start building up their understanding of the new and changing environment of technology and how it aids your problems and, and fixes things. So on the in-block side, the way we think of our business is we have two pillars. One is the in-block, which uses blockchain 
and digital asset servicing. And I'm not really going to speak much about it only because Kristen's gonna spend the bulk of this presentation on it. And on the other side, imagine how the banks, and banks are still the financial innovators in the world. There's many others, but they still are financially innovating and they were able to take these basically dormant invoices and channel them into being an asset class, right? Whether they're loans, whether they're an asset back. So we've been able to work with the banks to help them accelerate and help them develop the means to originate, to, uh, to manage their own accounts receivables or supply chain finance business, as well as deliver to them. And I believe we're the only platform that all in one place, right? is able to deliver to them access to the insurance markets as well. The way Jim thinks of things is whenever you build something and you give a customer access, what are they doing 30 seconds before and what are they doing 30 seconds after? So that's where insurance comes in, risk management comes in. So we're building out risk applications that access your own risk monitors and bring it all back in using great business analytic tools because the data is yours. But many times the difficulty is how do you build all of that into a, a workable stream so that you can manage your risk. Um, so that's the overview of Liquidex. We're really uh, privileged to speak and I'm going to hand the rest over to my colleague, Kristen. Thanks, Sally. So let's talk about the problem that um, we set out to solve on um, the platform side. So I spent many years, 20 plus years in uh, treasury in my career and um, tried to grapple with the issue of these manual assets that kind of downstream in the treasury process always cause havoc on payments and cash forecasting and liquidity management. Um, so if we think about the working capital space and specifically the AR and AP process, um, a lot of times these assets as we call them, so an invoice, a purchase order, inventory, um, it's really tracked and governed through physical documents. Um, so even if somebody might um, automate a portion of the process, it might actually be what I call like a swivel chair activity where somebody's taking a physical document, keying it into a system, but then it's still disconnected from the overall wing to wing process. Um, some of these metrics we put out here, you know, nine, nine to $15, the cost per invoice, we've seen that actually much higher with some of our clients. Um, you know, the percentage of the cash forecast with treasures being off around 50%. So a lot of forecasts in the corporate treasury space um, have plugs in them, right? So they can actually take the inputs from AP and AR and actually accurately forecast against them. A lot of times um, the knowledge of the humans around the forecast is actually more um, accurate than the inputs they receive from the source systems. So this is what we set out to solve. We want to make this a digital experience. We want to have digital assets. We want to be able to govern those digital assets with digital governance. And um, we'll kind of take you through what that looks like uh, in the in-block world at LiquidX. So many times our clients come to us and they, they talk about having an e-invoice, right? And an e-invoice to me is really a PDF statement of a physical invoice. So taking a picture, um, and the problem with that, you know, it's, it's great, right? You can um, move that through email and you can send that between companies, um, but it still involves an element of a human then to figure out and govern that asset because it's not actually in a digital form. And so InBlock is really about truly creating a digital asset. We want the invoice to be a digital asset. And then all the parameters around that invoice we want to govern through uh, our digital process, and we want to connect that data for the user. I, you know, pick on Allie because she's presenting with me. I don't want Allie to have to spend hours trying to figure out why the cash forecast was off in the corporate treasury space and have to drill back into systems to figure out what went wrong. You know, if you connect the data across the process, which is our premise, and then you put the governance around that, you should be able to digitally see that um, in one place. So things like, you know master services agreements that are multi pages in length, have a lot of terms and conditions around late fees, penalties, discounts um, that the customer can take um, on an invoice as an example. And so through digital digitizing that master services agreement, digitizing the asset, you're able to govern that. And blockchain is important because of all the different parties involved. 
many times it's the customer and the supplier that are involved, but think about the insurer that Ali mentioned or a distributor in the process. What blockchain does is it allows us to not only record the asset and key attributes of the asset, leverage smart contracts, but it also allows us that shared visibility to actually govern that asset and not have to reconcile between each other's systems. What we found is those manual processes actually yield a three to five times return on investment for those that um, invest in a product like InBlock that we offer, which is pretty significant. You're talking multi-million dollars with big corporates. And that's recurring savings. Exactly. Yeah. So we think about our company strategy. Um, we're, as Ali mentioned, we're all about the wing to wing solution, right? We don't wanna give you a vertical solution that solves one problem. We really want to connect across the process from wing to wing. So if we start on the left hand side of the page, this is a view for a bank kind of sitting in the middle um, on asset origination and on the left, and then the monetization or financing of those assets or ensuring those assets on the right. But you could swap this picture for a corporate as well with the corporate being in the middle and really managing their network of suppliers and buyers on the left and their relationships with their banks on the right. Um, so in this example, you know, the bank's customer sits on the left. What they're struggling with, you think about my prior life at GE, how do we manage our thousands of customer relationships? How do we manage our thousands of supplier relationships? It's not a one-to-one -one situation. So it's not one corporate talking to one other corporate and supplier. It's multiple legal entities working with multiple legal entities across these big corporations and they're crisscrossing, right? So in some cases, one's a supplier and one's a customer. In some cases they have reciprocal relationships where they also have a two full relationship. And so by digitizing that asset on the left, so automating the purchase order, the loan, the inventory, um, the insurance policy, you're allowing that digital asset to then transform through that network effect. And what it does then in this diagram is allows you to take those physical assets that are now in digital form and use them for working capital and monetize them, right? So historically these assets sat on your balance sheet, right? As a receivable. Now you can go out and easily through APIs transact those assets on our platform or other platforms, right? Other bank platforms, or you can insure those assets, right? So a lot of companies take policies out and trade credit insurance. They're managing this physical, insurance policy disconnected from the assets that are linked. So it's all through paper documentation. This actually gives you real-time visibility to see which assets you've actually gone out and financed. You know, have they been financed? Because sometimes they're short dated and they don't get financed. It updates that real time on the asset. Have they then been distributed by a bank? Has the bank gone and sold off that risk downstream? And so you start to connect that data across the ecosystem in the working capital space. I thought it would be useful to kind of give an example, and this is a corporate example of the order to cash process that um, InBlock works to automate. So InBlock can automate order to cash, procure to pay. Um, all these processes really start with a legal document that creates and governs a relationship. So usually that's done on paper, right? I think we're moving towards an environment where that's really a, turned into a PDF document, maybe integrated with DocuSign. What we do is we scrape in that document on InBlock and take those governing principles out to govern the asset. Um, you think about the order management process. A lot of that's done through um, manual updates, PO validations, single use platforms, um, invoice management as well. Any disputes are done through email. Kind of my statement of account is sent out through email. I'm governing Excel spreadsheets, emails, phone calls, when issues happen or just to get an update on where my asset sits in the life cycle. And then when you get to the reconciliation process, you have disconnected data. So why did my customer say they're gonna pay me on the 20th of the month, but I see the payment coming on the 30th of the month? Well, maybe they have payment patterns, right? That their accounts payable department pays twice a month on the 15th and 30th. 
And a lot of that data is not detected unless you look and you apply logic across the big data sets. And so reconciliation becomes a very manual intensive process. So a lot of corporations outsource that to a shared service center um, for a lower cost solution, but it still is costs and people um, and time taken away of actually using that cash, right? Because it takes days to actually reconcile the cash. And then you're also having disconnected cash flows with your asset. And then last but not least, um, the cash forecasting space, which is near and dear to me coming from the treasury space. Um, a lot of times you're the last leg in the puzzle, right? Um, along with finance, who does a lot of the reconciliations. And you're trying to figure out what happened, right? So when your cash forecast is on, it's, it's almost like a thankless activity. But when your cash forecast is off, there's a scramble to figure out what happened. And a lot of times that requires many analysts on your team to really go out and chase down open issues. And by the time you determine what those issues are, it's almost irrelevant, right? Because you've moved on to the next week um, or ne next cycle in your cash forecast. And so what InBlock does is really as one example of a process really looks vertically on automating, kind of removing those manual steps, giving visibility across, and then connecting. You see the linkage to LiquidX in the middle, connecting those assets out to a platform to actually benefit the corporate or the bank in that example um, to actually execute and use those assets. One of the things that um, may resonate with many of you is just the validations around an asset. So, you know, we've been in talks with a lot of um, folks around being an asset registry, right? And what does that mean? You know, you've seen in different jurisdictions, you see some fraud around assets. You see um, somebody actually selling an invoice and then reselling that invoice, right? And since there's no kind of common denominator in the space on invoice, there's no invoice registry globally, um, it's very hard to detect that. And so one of the things that we've built into InBlock is the ability to do what we call InBlock validation. So what we would like is down the road, when you purchase an asset and you know that it's been InBlocked, that comes with a level of certainty around that asset and the validations that are performed on that. Um, in addition to that, as we set up networks um, around, you know, healthcare might have different validations, for example, on their assets, and we can apply those assets. A bank might have different validations that are required for theirs. We can do those validations. And so um, what this blockchain solution allows us to do is also not only store those assets and store ownership, but track ownership, traceability across the assets, and then apply algorithms on top that allow us to do validations across that asset. What are some of the key benefits um, as well as we think in the space? So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about cost savings, right? So um, in the working capital space, tons of single use platforms, lots of um, resource time, and I'd say, Poor use of resource time. So resources that are um, reconciling transactions instead of applied to actually managing the relationship. And so, you know, what we've seen a lot of cost savings for our clients on is um, actually going out, redeploying those resources to efficiently uh, manage their relationships with their customers, their suppliers, to actually drive improvements and scalability across their business. Um, and then also the benefit of eliminating a lot of single use platforms um, and ancillary processes. Um, in addition, you think about the asset validation we just talked about. Um, we believe over time that an in-blocked asset should be viewed in a way that, that gives transparency to the life cycle of that asset and might be financed differently. You may get optimal financing because Instead of taking a risk and financing, the bank's taking a risk and financing an asset that doesn't carry the history, the corporate may choose to expose that history to get a preferential treatment on their assets in the financing terms. We've seen improvements, huge improvements to cash forecasting as well. Um, so because the data is connected, we have a digital asset that's traced through the life cycle and connected. So as things change on that asset, they go through um, disputes, delays, shipment delays, credit notes are applied, discounts are taken, assets are financed. We track the asset, but we also track the underlying cash flows. And what we're able to do is give real-time updates on those assets um, in the cash forecasting as well, whether it's ingested into an existing cash forecasting tool in a treasury organization um, or 
you know, somebody could use the cash forecasting in our product. I thought it would be useful to talk just a little bit about kind of how we think about the big data and the linkage with the DLT and, and different reporting analytics, because a lot of times when we talk about in block, it's covering a wing to wing process that is sometimes hard to kind of wrap your head around. Um, you get underneath and you wonder, is it really true that people, uh, you know, spend so much time manually governing these assets, right? Um, we did a project in one of my prior roles where we saw a payment hop 20 times in the life cycle across systems um, in one of our businesses. And very similar, we see that with a receivables transaction um, as well in the space. So I think- just, yeah. a, just a, a point, I was looking on chat and there was a question, why does it take corporations 60 to 90 days to pay the employees? There you go. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll just wait for the slide and you can explain. <laughs> That's a great question. So, and definitely, Ali, maybe if you can um, feel free to jump in with any of the questions because I'm not monitoring them. So feel free to yeah. jump in. And, um, yeah, so, you know, why does it take so long? Well you think, you know, in many cases, this data is sitting in multiple systems. Um, God forbid the person that's managing a dispute goes on vacation for a week and nobody else knows what's going on with that relationship. Um, we've seen in some of the cases, uh, the corporate is trying to collect on a receivable where that receivable has actually been financed, right? So you're chasing down cash flows on something that's actually been financed. Um, and so it's tough, right? And I've lived in that role. I ran a manage payment operations for GE and it's a tough, tough role. When you think everything's going great, you, an issue pops up. And so um, this is where we want to help actually really solve the problem for people. So when we think about in-block, we think about kind of four key components. The DLT is huge. We're on Hyperledger. Um, it's all about giving visibility to the asset, recording the asset, and having transparency to the asset and changes to the asset. Um, but on top of that is other functionality that is equally important. So the asset workflow. So actually connecting a network of individuals that need to operationally manage that asset. So it's very inefficient to use email and spreadsheets because what ends up happening if Allie and I are using email and spreadsheets, it's always a reconciliation of what she's sending me versus what I'm sending her. And so if you can connect those parties through, through a connected asset workflow, along with recording that asset for central visibility, that is like a huge piece of the process, right? And, and we're not out to compete with ERPs or treasury management systems. We see ourselves kind of sitting in the middle as a partner with them um, because we're not gonna go out and have the sourcing catalog on our platform. Um, we really think that we can optimally connect that process that sits somewhere in between and is kind of manual in nature um, and help accelerate for corporates that work in capital space. Um, the third piece is um, how do you think about big data? Because um, if you think about this working capital process, you're uh, consuming tons of data from your suppliers, tons of data from your customers, you're connected to bank APIs, so you're receiving and sending payments. So you're talking thousands, millions of rows of data. And then how do you think about the patterns on that data? How do I know when certain customers pay and do they pay in a consistent cycle? So you think about like a corporate space, you try to do your accounts payable run every week. Many times you have to do off cycle payments, but on quarter end and year end points, you might actually pay on a different day in that cycle. And so how do you start to detect patterns in this big data and use that to help you govern your asset? And so. We use machine learning to help with that as well. And that's another huge component of this process of really using that data to help you drive and manage your process more efficiently. And then the last piece is if I just gave you data, but I didn't help you visualize it and give you key outputs of that data, um, it probably wouldn't be useful to you. And so we use a lot with visualization and reporting and analytics to help you see those patterns, to help you detect when things go wrong. Like, so a red alert on things where cash flows are starting to go south, right? Green means you're looking like you're in good shape. You know, that seems like a really trusted piece of data that's been validated or has a historical trend against it. Um, so a lot of visualization around that big data. 
And so this is kind of our picture around how our technology comes together to give you a better view. And then the last piece, and then we'll, we'll hit on some of the questions, is really around you know, the different modules. We thought it might be helpful to kind of show you how we have built the product on our side. We think about it as a modular solution. So you know, integrated modules, you could purchase as standalone, but also if you really want to tackle the wing to wing, which is the nirvana of this, um, you can do that through these integrated modules. So all the way from kind of order management where you're capturing the quote, the purchase order, shipping details, um, to the point where it actually gets invoiced is captured in our order management module. And we do that through APIs and EDI connectivity, uh, flat files. We even have an easy user front end because we want to make this simple. We know that not everyone in this space um, has all the technology. And, and we don't want your technologies team doing a lot of work on their side to actually create changes from your systems. Um, the second piece is invoice management. So this is really the module where you're connecting all those parties and giving them shared visibility. So as things change, which happens in invoice management, everybody should be aware, right? And then those subsequent cash flows should be exposed to our cash forecasting module. In matches our reconciliation module. So this brings together all, of, if you think about the order to cash example I had, it could be for a corporate, it could be connecting and automating the cash application process of the invoice, the remittance advice and the re payment receipt from the customer. It could also be used in the back office of a bank um, to actually match those same cash flows to support one of their monetization programs, right? And then we have our monetization um, module, which is really Liquid X360, where you can actually take these assets that you've originated in InBlock and you can finance them, whether you want to participate in a supply chain finance program, sell your AR, you want to get trade credit insurance, um, though that's how you connect um, to the monetization platform and all those assets get updated as those go through the programs, as the assets go through those different programs. Um, cash forecasting records all the changes to the cash flows, right? So instead of when you have a question on a, a red item on your cash forecast, you can actually drill in and see which asset actually triggered that um, change. Or you can actually look forward and actually see where you're starting to trend in a red direction. And then last but not least is the position risk monitor, which actually pulls all this together and gives the corporate or the bank the ability to actually uh, assess their risk position, right? And make decisions off of that, right? And so this is kind of how we think about it. Um, a lot of our corporates are looking at this in the order to cash space, right? They use this for their order to cash or their invoice to pay. A lot of banks are using this to actually offer to their corporates to originate assets, right, that they want to monetize. It comes with that trusted, um, verified asset details. It's automated, so it's coming to them in a digital form instead of physical form. Um, and then the banks are also using some of the modules for their back office operations as well. So I'll pause in case we have questions. Actually, there's quite a few. Um... And one of them, I think you, you might have already answered, do you think digitizing will change timelines for invoice payments? Um, and, I, you know, why do corporations take 30, 60 days? So the answer would be yes. <laughs> yeah. I do think we will come closer in the future to the consumer space and the business space. Right? I spent a, a lot of time in my prior role working in payments and um, big advocate of things like Swift GPI. Um, it's just harder in the corporate space because of the disconnected nature of the data. But if we can get the data truly connected and in digital form, and you can start to show the benefits of the network effect where you have offsetting cash flows with different participants. So if Allie and I participate in the same network and we can actually see and have visibility to our offsetting cash flows, I think there's an opportunity to really enhance and um, give more of that consumer experience in the business space. I, I'll take this question. With what countries and currencies do you work with? So currently over 35 countries, jurisdictions that we're in and um, all, the, all the major currencies, but it's important to know that we are very open and it's a flexible platform so we can easily uh, upload an, a new currency relatively quickly. And, and on the uh, 360 side, not even the in-block side, we take other uh, base rates 
So it's not just the, the you know, G20 base rates that we take. Uh, we built a very flexible uh, platform that can, you know, really, really come to most countries. I, I will say that um, there was a question about helping regulators and compliance from Sandra. And it says, um, oops, it says, it seems like your solution could help audit compliance reporting as well as efficiency and cost savings. How should regulators, for example, financial services, see innovations like InBlock? So Kristen, I know you yeah. work with some of this, so you can take that. I think that's a great question. Um, so they look very positively on it, right? So maybe one thing that, a couple of examples that we've seen, um, you know, you have this digital form of the asset, um, but a lot of, the regulatories, even finance departments still want the physical form of the asset. So that's one of the things that we actually do is we actually store alongside the digital asset, actually the physical form and audit trail around that. Um, I think the regulators will continue to look favorably on products like this that carry all the history along with the asset. I can't imagine it not. You know where that asset originated from, you know what actions have been taken against that asset and you know where it ended, right? And so when you have that traceability across, I mean, to me, there's nothing better than that, right? Whether you're a regulator, whether you're somebody that wants to finance those assets, whether you're just a corporate participant that wants to look on trending on your relationship and influencing maybe a change in the relationship. The, the, there was a question about integration. So what kind of integration is required to implement in block and does it integrate with existing uh, systems? Sure, that's a great question. One of the things coming from the corporate space myself, I know that every time we looked at a new technology platform, uh, it, it took a lot of convincing um, because the technology resources on our side were always hard to get, right? Because they're always busy on projects, right? And so one of the things that we've um, said as our foundation, one, we're always going to offer the newest tech, but we're going to be integration partners from low tech to high tech solutions. So we'll take in a physical invoice, we'll scrape it in through our ingestion wizard, and we'll turn it into a digital asset for you. But if your technology can integrate through APIs, we're going to offer that. And so we do offer low tech to high tech integrations. And then the second kind of premise is that we're going to do the lifting for you. So we have uh, we call it the mapperator. I don't know if it's the right term to use, but um, right. we have this amazing mapperator tool that does the heavy work of mapping. So give me your in, your input format that comes out of the box out of your ERP, and I'll translate it into our format for you. Um, whether it's through a flat, flat file, you want to browse and upload the file on our UI, or you um, you want to send it through an API. Um, we are connected to um, the majority of large banks uh, through APIs and have had great experience with that, right? The banks offer this like great rich data through these APIs. Um, we also connect to service bureaus as well, but we've seen kind of enhanced data through these banking APIs, which has been really awesome. It's a very funny question. Um, are you hiring? Yes. <laughs> yes, actually. Uh, <laughs> if anybody's a great business analyst, we're looking for a sales leader on InBlock. Um, so we are a growing company. So if you if you are interested, um, reach out careers at inblock.com, I think it is, um, or feel free to reach out to Allie or I directly. Yes. And um, this is a, a pretty layup question, but how do you incorporate something like an email into your asset digitization? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So um, a couple of things we actually receive because remittance advice, when you think about the order to cash process, the buyers or customers, whatever you want to term them, they send in their remittance advice a lot of the time through email. And so we digitally ingest that and we store the email with the attachments next to the digital asset so we can scrape that in. Um, but we can also receive invoices through email, um, you name it. Um, so we've kind of built that flexibility. We know that, you know, again, everybody has high tech, low tech needs, depending on where they're at in their journey. So. Um, I, I was thinking about um, a couple of the questions and they bounce between both sides. There is a question. I'm not sure if we should answer it, but amazing product, why Hyperledger? So there's a few questions about um, it's but why Hyperledger and not sure. another blockchain? Yeah, so we we chose Hyperledger um, because we wanted the shared private network. Um, but in parallel with that, we are working to connect into a public um, public blockchain solution, right? And so um, I think we just started there because that was the point in our journey where we started. And um, 
but I think we want to make sure that we're um, offering this great product out, whether it's in that private blockchain solution or public blockchain form. There's a question about digitizing these assets. Does it create a secondary market? And if yes, what are the risks? And I, I have to just make one point. This secondary market for these asset classes exists today. Um, whether the, the, the banks that actually underwrite it, uh, sell it out and redistribute it, or many of platforms that do exist uh, do do the secondary distribution as well as the primary distribution. Um, and so uh, I, I think digitizing these assets, especially through an in-block process, de-risks. And I'll, I'll throw that one to you, that part of it to you, Kristen. Sure. Yeah, I definitely think it de-risks it. I think um, the the history on the asset, the, the piece that would keep me up at night if I was a funder would be knowing where this asset came from and is it the original asset or is it a copy of an asset that's already been financed. And so um, we do a lot of those traceability checks on our platform um, when we look for duplicates and validations and whatnot. Um, and so to me, that would be an enhancement. The other thing I'd mentioned too, Ali, is like traditionally the funders on these assets have been banks, but we've also seen a lot of asset managers, right? I don't know if you want to mention that as well. It's opened yeah. up a new market for them, right? A new. Yeah, so it, it, it's very, very interesting. So the risk appetite for banks continues to be strong, but in some cases, there is a movement to really try to electronify or digitize this particular asset class. And so, of course, the banks are trying to accommodate you on the corporate side, and they have some restrictions on how much credit, right, their balance sheet can take. So they're very happy to distribute it, as many of you know. And when they distribute it, there's a new uh, asset class of, of funders coming in, whether they're private equity firms, whether they're hedge funds, whether they're traditional asset managers, and they're looking for yield. We have negative returns on short-term papers. So this is you know, anywhere from 30 days to 360 day paper, traditionally 90 to 180 days. And they're very short-term assets backed by uh, a real asset, an invoice or a series of invoices, right? So. There is a growing amount of educated consumers that are looking for better yields and secure yields. And especially if they come in, and one of the reasons they're some of the biggest users of the insurance on our platform, they come in and they de-risk with insurance and they get a really attractive return with a backing of real assets backed by insurance. So it's a, a very low risk investment and yet they get very nice returns. So we do see that trend. Um, there's a question actually about trends you're seeing in large corporations, treasury departments. So I'll leave that one with you, Kristen. But um, the, is there also one of the sectors that are most interesting to you? And the answer is yes. So I'll leave that to you. Yes. <laughs> um, so we see, you know, still um, most of our discussions um, with big corporates are around, you know, cash forecasting is still a problem, right? And I think if you try to solve it in a vertical segment without looking wing to wing, as I call it, across the process, um, you'll get far, but you won't get as far as you probably can. And so we continue to see that trend where now um, corporate treasurers are looking upstream, right, along with their finance partners, right, because, you know, the finance, like the the ledger reconciliation is an equal nightmare, right? Having come from a big corporate. Um, so really joining forces, uh, considering their AP leaders and AR leaders, if they're separate from treasury as partners, um, leveraging the CFO that usually everybody reports into and really partnering and coming up with shared and common KPIs, KRIs to influence the process that benefits everybody. And so that's one of the big things I've seen. Um, I think the other, you know, a lot of kind of vertical investments in platforms, they get you, you know, so far, which is great. Um, but really this push with COVID to kind of rethink and reimagine um, how you may want to take a bigger leap uh, to really accelerate that digital transformation. Um, I've also, you know, I think it's, it's good to, to pause a bit and um, think about digital transformation, right? I think Digital transformation pre-COVID, um, there were a lot of companies that were ahead of the game there. Um, I always think it's worthwhile to kind of pause and reflect and see if you can uh, move faster. Um, we've seen a lot of interest with corporates, um, one to get educated in you know, what's machine learning, what's RPA, what's blockchain. Um, and we're happy to do education on that as well through our teams. We have some 
we have the best tech in fintech, as we call it. We really do. We have an amazing technology team. Our CTO is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they like to give back. They like to teach their, um, you know, so if ever there's an education opportunity, happy to do that. And I see that in the, in the treasury space specifically. And then to your last point on industry, we've seen big industry segments. I mean, everybody is looking at digital transformation. So um, I would say, you know, I haven't seen one that isn't. Um, just to be very clear. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Um, I, I wanted to take this one question. Are you doing anything in the climate theme classes? And <clears throat> there's two parts to this. One is we are uh, very excited about the ESG initiative and we are working to incorporate that into our uh, 360 platform. And so there is no one index standard around the globe today. Um, Quite frankly, I think the U.S. is somewhat behind in the initiative, so that's the um, E in the ESG, but we actually have a few large organizations that are asking us to track the S in the ESG, so we're being agnostic because we think ESG in general is very good for uh, the business world, and so we are working with different partners. Um, since Aaron, you asked a question, I would love to do a class, but I would also love to reach out to this community uh, on the GBBC or anybody that's dialed in today. And um, especially if you have ideas on um, what you'd be interested in seeing on the ESG, I would love to have it. And uh, we do have different members that sign up and help us on a working group or an advisory basis. And we would really appreciate that. And uh, and would definitely enjoy working with you and hearing your sites and where we can go to actually get um, better traction on our, uh, the way we're looking at it right now is we may try to build our platform so that we get uh, sort of recognized or be able to recognize different type of indices. Um, because at this point, you know, the flexibility to be able to adapt to what our customers are asking us for is more important than us picking the winner or loser in that game. But it's an important part of our of our culture. It's a big, it's a very important part of our initiative. And I would just add to um, with those validation uh, logic in InBlock, we're able to actually um, detect assets that originate from firms. To Ali's point, that you know comply with certain metrics. You've said whether it's a minority-owned company. Um, they've hit certain carbon standards like so that's something we're building into those validation engines for some of the network participants as well so something interesting is if you're a funder right and you have kind of a strategy on your side to actually purchase those types of assets that's another element you could consume those through in block right I, I don't usually use chat so forgive me somebody asked about so a role as director corporate client in London is this remote or sponsoring <laughs> <laughs> I meant to answer it, uh, typing it, but um, it, it, it is like we will entertain a role in, in the EMEA time zone. Um, and so if you're American, the only issue would be that, you know, we want somebody that can answer and speak with um, corporates in the EMEA time zone. And so that would mean that you'd probably be up at 1 a.m. So that should be a consideration. But like I said, there are loads of interested um, roles and please reach out now if we don't have a role today, we'll. Be developing and growing we are in fast growth mo mode so uh by all means if you have an interest in working with us or for us if not today tomorrow so we'd love to hear from you um there isn't one more last question i'm guessing that sophia we have one question left do you think of every corporate treasury digitized and improved processes there could be an argument made that you're de-risking the segment of financial services for example better transparency efficient processes effective Organ capital management improves systemic financial stability. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I think there's two pieces. Uh, I came from doing a lot of lean work at GE, um, which is process reengineering, and you got to do the process reengineering with the digital reengineering, right? So if you automate you automate a bad process, you get as far as that process goes. So um, I do think by Fixing processes, streamlining processes, removing the barriers and obstacles, which sometimes comes from things being disconnected from a data perspective, you are really transforming this space for the corporates, but also the space for the financial institutions, regulators, anybody who needs asset, you know, access to that asset information as well. So um, that's kind of our mission. We're really excited about it. 
So there's a lot of questions, but Sophia, I know this goes till 10 and we're hitting the 10 o'clock time. So really appreciate all those questions. And since we couldn't ask them live, please do feel free to come back to us and, and send it to us. Uh, I, I believe we have our emails up on the screen and uh, Christian and I will be more than happy to respond. Absolutely. Thank you, Kristen and Ali, for uh, spending time with us today and answering everybody's questions. We will circulate um, a recording of this webinar to all of you who dialed in and those who weren't able to make it, as well as contact information for Ali and Kristen at LiquidX. So uh, if you have any unanswered questions, those can be answered afterwards. Thank you again for joining us. This has been um, an absolute pleasure to listen to you today and to learn more about what LiquidX is doing. We look forward to following your progress um, and everyone. You can follow the GBBC as well for updates on LiquidX's work. Next week on the GBBC virtual members forum, we will be hosting the Filecoin Foundation. So stay tuned for that. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day, everyone.